In astronomy, we talk about billions of years like it's no big deal. But how can we be sure about timescales so far beyond the capacity for human intuition? Our discovery of what we now call deep time is very recent, as recent as our discovery of the true spatial vastness of our universe. And it came as scientists tried to measure the age of the Earth. What they found was as shocking and humbling as anything ever seen through the telescope. How long has the world been here? The question is surely as old as human civilization, and perhaps older. The earliest written record we have of a cosmogony, an origin story for the cosmos, came from the Sumerians, followed soon by the Babylonians. There were floods, dismemberments of gods, all that good stuff that was later adopted by other traditions. But the main thing was this notion that the world had a beginning. The early Jews adopted this idea, and in turn it was picked up by the early Christians, and the idea of a single unique creation event became a cornerstone of some of the earliest religious texts, like the book of Genesis. The Genesis story was so influential that many people used it to try to figure out the age of the world. Probably the most famous guess came from the Irish bishop James Usher in the early part of the 17th century. Usher looked not only at the Bible, but at hundreds of other ancient texts, trying to align the different and often conflicting histories that they presented. Usher eventually concluded that the world began at 6 p.m. on Saturday, October 22nd, 4004 BC. An oddly precise prediction given the source material, and obviously a bit lower than the value given to us by science. The French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, was among the first to use what we call scientific methods to calculate the age of the Earth, publishing his result in 1778. It was ingenious, really. He assumed the Earth started out as a ball of molten rock, which subsequently cooled down to its current temperature. Buffon spent six years measuring the cooling rates of materials in his lab, and then calculated that the Earth was 74,832 years old. And yes, that's also a weirdly precise number. Both Usher and Buffon docked half a point for excessive significant figures. Buffon's premise was clever, if flawed. His 75,000-ish years was too small, and we now know why. And I'll come back to that. At around the same time as Buffon was staring at warm lumps of iron, the Scottish geologist James Hutton wandered Britain, pondering the ages of its rock formations. He became convinced that they were formed when molten rock pushed through the crust from Earth's interior. This directly gave us igneous rocks like granite and basalt, while sedimentary layers resulted when these materials eroded and were deposited on ocean floors, to be later pushed up again in an endless cycle. Hutton's biggest breakthrough was that he reasoned that these processes were driven by the same forces operating in the world today, so-called uniformitarianism. But those processes were excruciatingly slow, and so Hutton realised the Earth must be unthinkably old. We can thank Hutton and his 1788 book, The Theory of the Earth, for opening scientific eyes to the possibility of an ancient planet, and the idea of what we now call deep time. The initial temporal vertigo was shocking. Hutton's collaborator, John Playfair, put it well. The mind seemed to grow giddy by looking so far into the abyss of time. Hutton didn't propose a beginning for the Earth, Instead, he assumed a series of infinite cycles. This was also the notion of the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant a few decades earlier. Kant wasn't afraid to throw out some numbers based on pure speculation. To quote, There has mayhap flown past a series of millions of years and centuries, etc., etc. Creation is not the work of a moment. By the way, Kant was also the first to have speculated about the existence of galaxies beyond the Milky Way island universes, as he called them. Deep time and deep space. We'd known since Copernicus and Galileo that Earth is just one planet among several in our solar system. Astronomers now swear by the Copernican principle, that Earth is not in a privileged position in the universe, and so the laws of physics also work the same everywhere. Hutton's uniformitarianism is a sort of temporal Copernican principle for geology. 
The idea was further developed and popularised by another Scottish geologist, Charles Lyell. In his Principles of Geology, published in the 1830s, Lyell talks about millions of years of geological processes. He speculates on a true beginning for the Earth, but doesn't try to date it. Instead, he imagines that it must be vastly older than geology can yet see, and he draws an astronomical analogy that the universe must be vastly larger than what was visible at the time. Lyell's work was incredibly influential, and not least to a young scientist named Charles Darwin. Darwin read Lyell's book during his famous voyage on the HMS Beagle. Lyell's ideas gave Darwin the millions of years he needed for his theory of evolution and its painfully low mechanism of natural selection. But Darwin was also into geology. In his Origin of Species, he estimates a minimum age for the Earth based on the erosion time scale for a chalk formation in southern England. His figure of 300 million years was actually too high for that formation, but we now know much lower than the true age of the planet. Of course, geology and evolutionary biology are now intimately connected. We can trace the progress of evolution by mapping the fossil record to the geological clock. The ordering of the appearance of ancient species is found when we date the rocks in which their fossils are found. We've now found fossils as old as 3.5 billion years. But to understand how we can possibly know that age, we have to turn from geology to physics. The discovery of radioactivity by Marie Curie and others in the 1890s would open up a new world within the atom and yield new tools for probing vast stretches of time. Ernest Rutherford discovered that certain elements released energy from radioactive decay at an ever-decreasing rate, and that some of those elements would slowly leak that energy over thousands or even millions of years. We now know that radioactive decay is responsible for keeping the interior of the Earth hot, and explains why Earth is much older than Buffon's 75,000 year estimate based on the passive cooling of a ball of molten rock. But the discovery of radioactivity also gave us our most accurate way to figure out the age of chunks of Earth through radiometric dating. Unstable atomic nuclei decay into light nuclei by splitting or by ejecting particles. The rate of decay is expressed in terms of half-life, which is the amount of time for a given radioactive nucleus to have a 50% chance of decaying, or equivalently, the amount of time it takes for half of a large number of radioactive nuclei to decay. In principle, if you know how much of the stuff there was to start with, you can figure out how long the radioactive material has been decaying. Figuring out the initial content is typically impossible, at least directly. Instead, there are some clever workarounds. Perhaps the most well-known example is carbon dating. In this case, we're interested in the decay of carbon-14. That's the version or isotope of carbon with eight neutrons. It's radioactive and decays with a half-life of 5,700 years. Carbon-12 and 13 isotopes are stable and so much more abundant. Carbon-14 exists on the surface of the Earth because it's produced when cosmic rays hit nitrogen in the atmosphere, resulting in a constant proportion of C14 within the atmospheric CO2. The carbon is incorporated then from the atmosphere into living organisms by photosynthesis. But when the plant, or whatever ate the plant, dies, the C14 content gradually drops. By measuring the current C14 content relative to the stable C12 and C13 contents, the age of once living material, including fossils, can be determined. But this is only accurate to around 10 half-lives, or 50,000 years. More useful for measuring the age of the Earth is uranium lead dating. Uranium decays on much longer timescales, 710 million years for the U-235 isotope and 4.5 billion years for U-238, with both decaying into different isotopes of lead. You can figure out how much uranium a given sample had to start with by looking at the proportion of uranium to lead. This only works if you can be sure that no lead was in the sample to start with. And in some cases, you can be sure. Some crystals, like zircon, tend to incorporate uranium atoms into their crystal structure when forming, 
while at the same time repelling lead. So any lead that you find in those crystals came from uranium decay. By looking at the ratios of each type of uranium to the corresponding isotope of lead, you get two independent ages, which will match up if the crystal has not lost any of its lead. But the comparison of the two ratios in something called a Concordia diagram allows you to correct for any lead loss. The other cool thing about this technique is that the different half-lives of each uranium isotope means this radiometric technique is useful between hundreds of millions of years to many billions of years. By the 1920s, British geologist Arthur Holmes would declare that the Earth was between 1.6 to 3 billion years old, based on his radiometric dating. This was around the same time that astronomers proved that Immanuel Kant's island universes were indeed other galaxies many millions of light years away. The world simultaneously got a lot older and the universe a lot bigger. Older rocks were discovered, pushing back the Earth's age further and further. But beyond a few billion years, it starts to get tricky. There aren't many patches of land left from way back then. Most of the original crust has been recycled into the mantle. One of the few remaining OG patches is in Western Australia. There, zircon crystals have been found as old as 4.4 billion years, based on uranium-lead radiometric dating. But to go beyond that date, we have to look beyond the Earth. We believe that the Moon formed at the same time as the Earth, both coalescing after a giant planetary impact in the early solar system. Now, the Moon is tectonically inactive, so rocks on its surface now were there when it formed. The Apollo missions brought back lunar specimens that have been radiometrically dated to 4.5 billion years. That jibes with our measure for the age of the solar system, nearly 4.6 billion years. We get the same number from radiometric dating of solar system meteorites and also from our calculations of the age of the Sun. I should add that science took its time getting to these large numbers for the age of the world. The Mayan long count calendar includes cycles of 63,000 years. Hindu tradition has a cyclic cosmology with nested epochs lasting millions of years. In fact, a single day of Brahma is 4.32 billion years oddly close to the age of the Earth, although it looks like we survived at least one day of Brahma and the last long count transition, so I'd say we're good for now. So, the picture has come together. There's consistency in that 4.5 billion-ish year age across several independent measures. That gives us some confidence in the results. The confidence in the number may be justified, but perhaps we've become a bit too comfortable with it. These days we stare down at the unfathomable gulf of the past and shrug, and we forget that the entire span of human civilization is the width of a single hair on our heads compared to the stratified depths of the Grand Canyon. Not that our ancient Earth cares, it's revolved around the Sun 4.5 billion times through deep space and out of deep time. And it'll do the same again, into what I guess you could call deep space time. Bring the comments from my apartment once again. The New York COVID-19 lockdown cannot be allowed to interfere with the important work of talking about black holes. And last episode, we went all the way through the black hole to talk about the speculative parallel universe on the other side. Your own speculations were impressive. A few of you asked whether the Big Bang could be thought of as a white hole. Well, the answer is that there are similarities but they're probably not the same. First, the similarities. The Big Bang is a singularity. It's the point of infinite density when you rewind the expansion of the universe so there's zero distance between all points in the universe. From that infinitely dense point, all of this energy and space expanded from the point and time flows away from that point. The difference is that in the Big Bang, the singularity was comprised of the entire universe. There were infinite points at zero distance. It encompassed all of space, and so the Big Bang happened everywhere at once, and it didn't expand into anything. The white hole, on the other hand, would be an actual point within a larger universe, and so it's expanding into something. This is the stock response based on a standard mathematical description of the Big Bang, but this probably also deserves a lot more depth and its own episode. 
Klimkow asks why some sources place the Einstein-Rosen bridge at the top of the Penrose diagram leading to a new white hole instead of to the side of the Penrose diagram as we saw in that episode. Well, those diagrams that you're thinking of are Penrose diagrams of a rotating or a Kerr black hole. The original Einstein-Rosen wormhole was for a non-rotating or Schwarzschild black hole. In the Kerr black hole, the central singularity is a ring and passing through the ring and back out appears to transport you to the interior of a white hole that ejects you into a separate region of space-time that can be interpreted as a new universe. And yeah, you don't need superluminal speeds to do that. Now, we'll also explore the detailed nature of wormholes and the interior of the Kerr black hole in their own episodes. Well, I really get the best episode ideas from your comments. A few of you asked about the painting behind me. I'll quote Canuck Monkey 13 who finds it utterly fascinating. What is it? Who made it? Is it unique? Well, actually, it is an original, but don't worry, I don't earn nearly enough to cover my apartment in giant gold leaf paintings. I'm lucky I can afford the wall behind it. Actually, this was painted by my incredibly talented partner, Bahar. And no, I don't just date her for the art, but it's a big plus. Neil, Carl and Corey came to the comments section to say hi from Fraser Kane's channel, where I did a live stream last Monday. It was a fun conversation and worth a listen, but even more worthwhile checking out the rest of Fraser's amazing channel. Oh, and you'll get to see another corner of my apartment. Now, Zay Zabster requested a full tour, maybe after a serious cleanup. Right now it's a maximally extended Schwarzschild solution. I was actually amazed at how many people noticed that acronym in the last episode but there was an even more brilliant black hole acronym joke from Seraph from the spinning black holes comments. Panic at the innermost stable circular orbit. I have high hopes you guys will get that joke. 